Welcome to the Harrison Podcast Series. The first podcast is entitled, ACS, Getting the Story Straight. So let's set the scene. There you are minding your own business on night float when the cardiology fellow calls you. The cardiology fellow is just having one of those nights, so all they're able to tell you is that it's a 61-year-old man here with chest pain. The learning objective for this podcast is to be able to accurately determine the likelihood that a patient's symptoms represent ACS due to coronary artery disease. When you evaluate a patient admitted with possible acute coronary syndrome, you need to focus on the following five categories of information. First, historical risk factors. Second, elements of the history of present illness. Third, the physical examination. Fourth, laboratory data. And finally, ECG findings. We'll begin with historical risk factors. In reviewing the patient's chart and in gathering the history from the patient, focus on the following historical risk factors for coronary artery disease. Diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, extra cardiac vascular disease such as stroke, TIA, or peripheral arterial disease, a history of tobacco use, and a family history of coronary artery disease in first-degree male relatives less than 55 years old and in first-degree female relatives less than 65. Now we will review the important elements of the history of present illness. It should be noted that an accurate and detailed history is key in appropriately assessing a patient with suspected ACS. When gathering the history from the patient, focus on the description of the pain. Gather information about the quality of the pain, the timing and radiation, as well as associated symptoms and exacerbating or alleviating factors. Classic anginal pain will be described as squeezing or pressing in nature in the central chest that radiates to the left arm or jaw. It is typically last on the order of minutes, is associated with shortness of breath, diaphoresis, and is exacerbated by activity and alleviated with rest. It is also important to ask the patient about specific non-cardiac chest pain descriptors. Pain that is pleuritic, localized by one finger, reproduced with movement or palpation, that is constant for many hours without biomarker elevation, that lasts for only a few seconds, or that radiates into the lower extremities, is unlikely to be representative of anginal pain. We will now review physical exam findings in the patient with suspected ACS. When examining a patient with suspected ACS, focus on the general appearance. Is the patient currently experiencing pain? Are they diaphoretic? Are they short of breath? Are you able to reproduce the pain? Palpate the area of the chest where the pain is located. Move the arm and evaluate for a musculoskeletal component. Have them take a deep breath or cough to evaluate for a pleuritic component. Palpate the abdomen for potential intra-abdominal pathology that has been mistaken as chest pain. Look at the chest and the skin, and then finally, do a thorough cardiopulmonary exam. Concerning findings on physical examination would include a new murmur of mitral regurgitation, which would be a holosystolic murmur best heard at the apex. The finding of an S3. The finding of pulmonary edema or rales, hypotension, bradycardia, or evidence of extra cardiac vascular disease such as decreased peripheral pulses or a carotid brewery. Next, we will discuss the important laboratory data to evaluate in a patient with suspected ACS. The most important laboratory data to obtain in a patient with suspected ACS are cardiac enzymes such as troponin and CKMB. Remember the importance of obtaining serial measurements as cardiac enzymes will be expected to rise over time. Other laboratory data to evaluate for other causes of chest pain such as severe anemia and hemoglobin, white blood cells and infectious causes may also be obtained. The final important piece of information in evaluating a patient with ECS are ECG findings. When evaluating the ECG of a patient with a suspected acute coronary syndrome, look for the following findings. T-wave inversion, ST depression greater than half to one millimeter, ST elevation greater than one millimeter and two contiguous leads, 
or significant Q waves that are evidence of a prior myocardial infarction. So now let's put it all together. The following table is from the ACC AHA guidelines on the management of unstable angina or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. You will find that now based upon the categories of information we have discussed, you should be able to classify your patient as either having a high, intermediate, or low likelihood of having ACS due to coronary artery disease based upon their signs, symptoms, EKG, and cardiac biomarker findings. Take a moment to review and then we will practice with the case. Your patient is a 61-year-old with a history of hypertension and tobacco use with chest pain. The pain began today and there have been two episodes. It is centrally located chest pressure that does not radiate. It is associated with diaphoresis and lasts about 10 minutes with each episode. It is not pleuritic nor positional. He has no family history of premature coronary artery disease. He does not use illicit drugs. His cardiac biomarkers are normal and his EKG shows 1 mm T-wave inversion in his inferior leads. Based upon the information provided in the case, how would you classify this patient's risk of ACS due to CAD? That's correct. This patient would have been classified as intermediate risk. From a review of this chart, you will find that the patient had none of the signs or symptoms listed under high likelihood, but did have chest or left arm pain as their chief symptom. The patient was a male, and the patient had T-wave inversion greater than one millimeter.